we'll just make do. Uh, first, do you have questions about the board? Anything at all? Go do it. Any questions? Did you do it? All right. Did, I mean, do you understand it? Uh, I didn't get a chance to do it. I was going to do it this weekend. All right. Uh, so today, that was boundary conditions we covered. Today, what we're going to do is magnetic forces. And this is important. And if we have time, we'll get to inductance. So this is something, this, this is sequential in the book, if you look in chapter four. So this is magnetic forces. Wow, well, this is an absolutely brand new marker. And it seems to be not doing too well. forces. Uh, this is sort of basic physics that you have. If you have a charge Q, you can think about there's an electric force on this. And the sub E is for electric. And that force right here, the electric force, is just Q times E. So if you know the E are present and you want the force, you just multiply it by Q. You all with me on that? Remember that. And that, that was important because the way, the way we got all these laws, mathematical laws, is from experiments. And they defined the fundamental unit of charge and they could measure the displacement of pitfalls. And then because they knew what gravity was, they knew mg was the, uh, really the force pulling down and then the force really pulling up on a strip or really the electrostatic repulsion this way was QE and they could figure out what the actual value of Q was in a, in a very clear way from that. So that this is equal to QE. Well, if there's, that assumes there's an electric field, E. Now, if there's a magnetic field, B, there's a force too. This is the force due to the magnetic field. But here, in order for there to be a magnetic force, the particle has to be in motion. So it has to have some velocity v. And I'll break this out a little more. And therefore the magnetic force is qv cross v. And there's, this is the magnetic force. And there's some very interesting things about that statement. It means the force is always perpendicular to both the B field and the velocity. Now, this becomes extremely important for a lot of reasons. So if I have a charged particle Q and it's moving in this direction, let's just give it a, let's give it a coordinate system. Let's call this X, Y, and Z. So we have a coordinate system. And I'm going to say V is equal to 3 meters per second AY. I'm going to say Q is equal to 10 to the minus 9 coulombs, or 1 nanocoulomb. Now I'm going to define the B field. So I'm going to put B field here. And I'm going to have it coming out. I'm going to say the B field is going to be, this is going to be a big one. 10, and the units of B field are Weber's per meter squared. It's a flux. And it was going to be in the AX direction. Now that's a big field. And I'll explain. I, when you get value of, of like 1, 10, 100, Weber's per meter squared, or another word for that is Gauss, that's a large magnetic field density. If you go into an MRI, you get magnetic field densities upwards of maybe 10 to the third to 10 to the sixth Gauss. But this is huge. 
And if you look at this, the magnetic force is QV cross B, right? So do the math on this one. Q is 10 to the minus 9. By the way, that's a fair amount of charge, one particle, or one, you might say, chunk of stuff. Then V itself is equal to 3. I'm going to just leave it as default units, meters per second, A, Y, crossed into B, which is 10. And the units of force, if you use the MKS system, will always be newtons. Now, you all with me on this? Remember, MKS system, it's kilograms, meters, seconds, and newtons. So if you take a look at this, it's going to be 3 times 10 is 30 times 10 to the minus 9, or 3 times 10 to the minus 8. And here, it's going to be in what direction? This is 10 ax. So what direction is it going to be in? What? Minus ay. Yeah, it, well, it's ay crossed into ax is minus az, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Uh, so it's minus az. I thought of something that said something different for whatever reason. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be minus az direction. And that's pointing down. It means the actual force is in this direction, right? Y'all with me? Now we can go through and I could give you a few more little examples of this where I give you a magnetic field and I want the force. But the way the problems are usually set up is the magnetic field is caused by something. So let me do it this way and I'll ask you. Suppose I'm in free space, so I'm in air, say, and I have a current on the z-axis. And the current is 10 amps. Now, if I come over here and call this x, y, here, I've got z already here. Here's the origin. I'm going to say I have a particle that's at a distance say y equals three meters away, and this particle is moving straight down at a velocity v is equal to, uh, say, a thousand meters per second, and this would be in the minus az direction. And I'm gonna say the charge on this particle, q, is equal to, one microcoulomb, or 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. Y'all follow me on this? And mu zero is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. And this is going to be 10 raised per meter of the units of this. And mu relative for air is 1. So I want the force on that. Here's a typical kind of quick question on a quiz. I want the magnetic force on that particle. So how do you get that? Well, first, you write down the stuff because you were just in it. Actually, you had this in physics. Do you all remember this in physics? QV cross B? Yes. It's basic. It's something that you get over and over again in physics. It's like the F equal MA kind of deal. All right, well, you write down the fundamental equation. It's QV cross B, right? All right, do we have Q? Yes, 10 to the minus six. And what's V? I gave you two of the three. 10 to the third, minus 10 to the third AZ, right? right? So it's really minus 10 to the third AZ. And I have to cross this with B. How do I get B? I give you an infinite current, right? Do we know what the H field is? What's the H field from an infinite current at a radial distance rho? Do you remember that? This is something you got to remember. Right, and it's in the A-V direction. So here, 
if you use the right hand rule, the B field right in the plane of the board on the side would be going in that direction, which happens to be the minus x direction, if you look at my coordinates. You all see that? It's in the A phi direction. The A phi circulates this way, right? So here the B or the H field would be equal to I over 2 pi. Now rho is just the distance from the perpendicular out of the center of this infinite line to the point of observation. I said that's three meters away. So we divide by three, right? And in the plane of the board, it would, on this side, it would be going in the minus AX direction. Did y'all see that? Now, if I was over here, if I was the same distance away and I wanted the H field, then it would be going, it would still have a magnitude of I over two pi divided by three, but it would be in the positive AX because I'm on the other side. Just make sure you understand that. All right, that's fine. I can replace I by 10, because I actually put 10 there, right? And that would be H, right? We can do the math. It's really, what, 10 over 6 pi. That's fine. How do I get B, though? This is H. What do I do? Well, remember the relationships, that B is equal to mu H, right? It's real important. And D is equal to epsilon E, right? And J, these are the ones you need to know, like the back of your hand, the sigma E. So if I look here, what do I have to do to H to get B? Can you all read that? Multiply by. Mu, right? And mu naught. So, I'm just going to put a mu, I'm going to multiply this by mu naught and put it up here. So I have, and I'll leave mu naught as mu naught there. Mu naught times 10 over, and that, that's 3 times 2 is 6 pi, right? And it's in the minus AX direction. So what does the magnetic force become based on this? Here's my suggestion to you. First, multiply the constants out. Then worry about the crossing. So I have mu zero. I'll put that right off out in front. And then I have a minus sign here and a minus sign here. So I'm going to get rid of them. All right? Then I have 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the third, which would be 10 to the minus 3, right? Then I have that times 10, that's 10 to the minus 2 divided by 6 pi. Do you all agree with that? And then what do I do with the cross product? What do I get? AX, or I mean AZ, right? Cross an AX is minus AY. Do you all follow me? Minus AY, right? So it's minus AY. Take a look at how small that is. That's 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. Then it's times 10 to the minus 2, right? Over 6 pi minus in the AY direction. I circle my minus signs a lot of times so I don't forget them. If you look at that, the pi's go, right? And then I have. 4 6 or 2 thirds times 10 to the minus 9. It's minus 2 thirds times 10 to the minus 9 ay, and the units would be newtons. Now, you don't really have a good feel for a newton, but you have a feel for a pound, don't you? I mean, a, a pound at sea level means as meaning to you. What's the relationship between pounds and newtons? Does anybody have uh, Google or anything? It, what is it? Is it about 5.5 pounds or so? 5.5 newtons is a pound? Something like that. It's about five, uh, roughly, I remember it's five newtons is a pound. But you check, tell me if I'm right or wrong. One pound is Four, one, four, five, newton. All right, so it's 
four, call it at four and a half newtons per pound. And if you think about that, if this is a newtons, we'd have to divide this by 4.5 or 4.45 to get pounds. 10 to the minus nine pounds is just about nothing. Y'all follow me? Now, you'll notice we were in air. I took 10 amps is not a current that's astronomically large or small. You can get 10 amps very easily in typical things. But you can see the magnetic force is triggered. Huh? For the charge, I had one uh, microcoulomb. And, and that's, it's hard to get a good feel for charge with typical stuff. But if you did a pith ball or you're, you know, took a pith ball and rubbed it on your head, you've done rubbed balloons on your head, you stuck them on walls, you get about that much. It ain't much. Not at all. All right. Now, so that's charge, and now I've got to tell you why that's sort of important to us. I mean, this is QB cross B is the magnetic force on a moving charge, and you have to have the B field to get this. But the B field can be created by any kind of current distribution, so you have to be aware of what H fields come from the current distribution and then multiply them by mu. Now, Here's something that you should be aware of. This is called a magnetic bottle, really. I gotta show you a basic relationship. So if I have a B field here, and this B field is, I'm going to put it into the board. The way you show something going into a plane is usually with an X, a circle with an X. And I'm going to say the B field, as a matter of fact, let me draw the coordinate system. So this is X, this is Y, and this is Z. Z is going straight up. So here B, I'm going to say, is going to be equal to some B naught, just a scale value, and it's going to be in the minus AX direction, AX. You all follow me on that? Now that B field is the same everywhere. Just assume it's identical everywhere. And then, I'm going to take a charged particle right here. Actually, I'm going to put it here. And I'm going to have this charged particle, the charge Q, and it's going to be moving at a velocity V. Initially, is going to be some V naught A Y. You all follow me? Now, you know that the force on any charged particle and this, this has got a charge of Q. I don't know where you get Q, but right there. The force on a charged particle is QV cross B, right? Now here, just say it's a T equals zero. Take a look at the direction of the force on this particle. I have, first the magnitude would be what? Well, the magnitude, since B and V are orthogonal to one another, by the way, you can get this, the direction of force really easy. If you got a right hand, everybody here does, take your right hand and put your finger, right, index finger in the direction of the velocity of, of the particle. And then take it and use it as a wiper arm and cross it into the direction of the B field. In other words, like make a gun, that's V, cross B, and your thumb points in the direction of the force. You can see the force is upward here, right? Y'all with me on that? 
And that force, if you wanted to, would have a magnitude of Q B, magnitude B, times magnitude of B, and the direction would be up where it would be A Z. And you could cross it if you have A Y crossed into minus A X, it's positive A Z. But you can see that. Now here's the crazy thing, huh? Now you can just watch it. Remember, it's going that way. There's a force accelerating it that this way, right? So in a little bit, what will happen is the trajectory will bend upward and it will be going like this. Do you all see that? It will gain no energy because the only way it can get, it gain energy is if the force is in the direction of the path, right? It's the integral of f dot dl. So the force will be perpendicular. Then when it's going here, it's qv cross b, and now the force will be in this direction. Do you all follow me on this? Then it'll bend up a little more. And what you'll find out is this thing is going to spiral this way, all the way around a circle, like this. That's, that circular thing is called a bodily effect. So how do we figure out what the radius of this circle is? And I'm just going to put it here. Call this radius r. And here's how we do it. That particle that's spinning around, and I'll do it right here, all right? It has a charge Q, but I didn't tell you it has a mass M. I didn't do that, all right? It's got to have some mass. You can't have a charge without mass, so it's got a mass M. And now you go back to physics. So there's one thing that I've learned in my life that when you take courses like chemistry, physics, the reason they give them to you is because you're going to need that information to further your career. You don't have to use it all the time. But remember in physics and kinematics, you learned one very important lesson. You learned, learned if you have a string of a radius r and you're spinning something at a velocity v, right? If this thing's moving at a velocity v all the way around here, I think they do it with a stone or something they'll talk about. You just take a, a string and you put something at the end of it, like a sinker, and you whip it around. There's an acceleration, an outward acceleration. And you remember if you have this, there'd be an outward acceleration equal, actually it's inward, inward on the stone. It, the stone is feeling the acceleration that would be equal to V squared over R. Do you remember that? See? It's feeling that, and the string has to confine it, so it has, I mean, the force here would be equal to m v squared over r, pulling it that way, right? And if you were whipping it around and you cut the string, then uh, it would feel an acceleration of v squared over r initially, and would just take off, it would feel force. Um, but the string itself is, has an equal and opposite force, so the thing is just gonna move in that orbit. Do y'all remember that? Sure. And now what we do is we do a force diagram with this. And we say this. I mean, we're going to use the magnetic force pulling it in and the centrifugal force pushing it out. So now I do this. I say this particle has a force moving this way, a magnetic force, equal to Q V cross B. That's just going to be a magnitude. And the reason it's a magnitude is because I know that this force will change its direction depending on the position of this particle, if it's going this way. And that force is exactly equal to the acceleration or centrifugal force, which is m times v squared over r. Do you all follow me on this? Right? I mean, v squared over r is going to be the acceleration times m is a centrifugal force. So here I say that's equal to m times v squared over r. Now what I'm going to do is calculate the radius that the thing's orbiting. Can you all see this? Are you with me, Ryan? The v squared yes. over r is the acceleration, right? V yes. squared over R is the acceleration, the centrifugal acceleration, 
the magnetic, it, it, we call it the, mag the force would be that times m. So now, what I'm going to do is solve for the radius. But look here for a second. You can see that one of these v's cancels, does it? This is magnetic and this is centrifugal force, and the force due to acceleration from uh, the thing rotating. So now what I'm going to do is simply, I'll, I'm going to get rid of one of these v's, so I have q v naught here on that side is equal to m right there times v over r. You all see that? I got cancel duty. And then I solve for r. So I see the radius, really r, which is the radius. is equal to m v over q b v naught. And that's the radius of gyration of this thing. Or it would be the distance from some center point that the thing will revolve around. Now why is that important? Well, if I have a magnetic field like I've shown you here, and say it's constant everywhere, and I fire a particle into here, assume it's a vacuum, at a velocity v naught, the particle has a uh, mass, and it will just spin like this forever. Now that's not quite true, because as it's spinning, it's accelerating, and whenever a charge is accelerating, you'll learn later that it radiates. It radiates electromagnetic energy, and therefore it will decrease, but that, that's, that's advanced. For now, though, ideally, the thing would just spin and spin and spin. Now, in the real world, we have things, and it, it's these, if you put a whole bunch of charge into an area, a vacuum like that, they would just spin, it's called a magnetic bottle. Are you with me? And the radius is determined by the ratio of Q, or of M to Q, or Q to M. And the larger the value of Q, for a given m, the smaller the radius, the higher the b field, the smaller the radius. And the velocity can be equated to the energy. Now, if you think about the Earth's magnetic field, this is something you should have an appreciation for as engineers. You all know when we talk about the Earth, our Earth, it actually has a magnetic field and I'm sure you know about this because that's how a compass works. It does this, right? Basically, right? Now, when we talk about the Earth's magnetic field and uh, the effect of magnetic bottling, if you look around the poles, the magnetic field somewhere, it's actually going to tilt. There's, the magnetic field is coming out just about vertical, right? It's actually going to tilt. So, and by the way, if the Earth didn't have a magnetic field, we wouldn't be alive because of the solar radiation. It deflects all these charged particles. So when the sun emits particles, like so, they come in here, and I get Q times QV, which is going this way, crossed into B, which is this way, and the force is outward, and they're deflected. They're more or less going to be, they'll never get in, all right? The high velocity charged particle. This is deflected. However, I should have rotated this. There'll be a, if you think about this, when the Earth is actually like this, but it's got a tilt, which ours actually does, there are particles that are coming in that have a component in this direction, and those particles that were coming in, there's a long, I could get into a long discussion about this, that are gonna be coming in in this direction, if you can follow me, they're along the magnetic field lines, right? Now just watch. Remember that the force is QV cross B. So if, if the actual electrons coming in, or the charged particle, say uh, an alpha particle is coming in, and it's in aligned with the magnetic field lines, the force is zero. You all follow me? But the truth is around the poles, right here, what happens is they'll have a component like this. It won't be straight down. And what happens is it will deflect and it will spiral like this, all right? If you have a magnetic field in this direction and you got a particle coming in straight down, there's no deflection at all. But if it's coming like this, then 
The component of velocity perpendicular to this field line causes a force, and it causes the thing to spin down. And that spinning causes, and do you know what the aurora borealis is? Have you ever heard this? Or the southern lights, northern lights? All right, well, they're caused by solar flares that come in contact with the magnetic field of the Earth, and then the particles are spiraling down, and as they come into the atmosphere, they collide. And when they collide, they cause, it's basically just, just like any kind of photoelectric effect, they collide, they knock off charges, they knock off electrons, then when they go from the different shell levels, they give off photons, and that's how fluorescent light works, basically. Um, and you'll get this glow in the atmosphere. Now, you guys live, has anybody ever lived really in the northern area? Well, I can, I mean, I, I live in here, I lived in Erie, Pennsylvania. I think we could see it every once in a while when it's extreme, but if you lived in Canada, if you lived up there in Alaska, for sure, you look up in the wintertime and you'll see the northern lights. It's like a gigantic glowing mass up there and it's caused, it's not real bright, but it's caused by the magnetic bottling effect. Now the truth is this, too, we use this in a lot of other areas, because you realize that that radial distance right there is given by this, right? All right, how many have heard of the term mass spectrometer for gas chromatography? Well, what they do is have a very low pressure device, and they put a large magnetic field in this direction. And then they inject charged particles. If they wanted to find out what a substance was, they'll charge up, e uh, they have to get this thing into a, uh, into a molecular form where it's basically single molecules. And they'll attach a single charge to them. And when they come in, their radius that they orbit is given by this. They have a certain mass, they put a charge on them, the velocity is controlled by these grids that they accelerate through. They have a constant, I mean, they know the energy they come in with. So then when they're spiraling, spiraling around, what they'll do is open a grade and deflect all the particles by changing the value of B with a certain mass to charge ratio. And they can see how much, or they can actually see what the substance is by the ratio of mass to charge with a mass spectrometer. You can look this, look up this thing. These are, this is also what's needed. Have you heard the term gas centrifuge at all? Do you know how in Iran they're trying to make nuclear materials, nuclear, they're trying to get high grade uranium, um, fissionable uranium. And um, uh, a gas centrifuge um, works like this too. And I mean, that actually, without getting into too much, there are a lot of things that are based on this principle of using magnetic, really the ratio of uh, mass to charge to determine what the actual substance is because the mass to charge will be constant by changing the velocity in the B field. They can actually get the things at a given radial distance and then they can take a look at the numbers. It's real, it's important. Okay, so that's basically, um, magnetic bottling, and that's important to know as electrical and computer engineers, because they do have all sorts of equipment based on this. As a matter of fact, without getting into too much of this, uh, the original radars were created using a magnetron, and what a magnetron is is a cavity resonator that has a very large magnetic field and causes the electrons to bang around in a certain orbital fashion. And I can't say too much about this, but I believe in part it's based on this principle. So now, the next thing I'm going to talk about are magnetic forces from currents. And I have had some experience with this because we built a, we built a couple of rail guns. And these are, these are basically things that create large magnetic fields and large particles based on, uh, based on the force induced in a current carrying conductor. So, I'll take you through a real quick way. I'll show you the physics. So here we're going to talk about uh, magnetic forces on current. On current. 
occurrence. So here's how it works. It, it's very simple, almost identical to the previous one. Before, if I had a charged particle with a velocity v, and there was a magnetic field b, I knew that the force here, this is not a good one, was given by qv cross v. I know that this force, actually it's down. This has got a charge Q, the magnetic force is QV cross B. All right, well, if I have a current element right here, a current I DL, DL would be the vector, differential vector length, it would have some magnitude and it would be uh, some direction. And I have a B field like such, then the differential force on that would be I DL cross B. With me? Very similar. Instead of QB, I have I DL. So how does that, what bearing does that have on? Let me show you the classic problem. Normally, we're going to have two wires, say they're in the z direction. E, this is the z direction. And call one of them on the axis. This is the x. This is y. And then a second current right parallel to it. going to have another current here, and they're parallel to each other, and they're separated by a distance v. Uh, they're in the plane of the board. And what I want to know is, I want to know the force per meter on this wire. So I'm looking for the force per unit meter on this wire caused by the magnetic field from this wire. Can you all follow me on this? So just look at this chunk that I've got here as a differential amount. Maybe I should color it. That'll work. So you take a look at this. This will be my IDL, right there. I'm looking for the force or the differential force. So how do I go about getting that? Now just think of what I said over here. I D L cross B, so I'm going to put it up here. Differential force. Differential magnetic force is I. I said I have some I. DL. Well, if I'm going in that direction, I say that's DZ. It would be I times DZ AZ. You need a vector direction. Are you with me? So that's IDL. It has to be crossed into B, right? So how do I get the B field over here? All right. First, I have an infinite wire here on the axis, right? Just a second ago, I gave a problem where I had an infinite wire and I needed a B field. What did we get first? H field. We did. And so before I say B field, what is the H field over here at a distance D away in the plane of the board? Remember, that's going to be X 
yz. So what's the magnitude? Remember this? Willie, you're the one that answered last time. Magnitude of the h field from an infinite line is? It's i over 2 pi radial distance, right? In this case, I put down d, so it's d. And this one would be what? It would be into the board, or it would be in the minus x direction, right? You all see that? So it's in the minus ax direction on this second wire. Now, if that's the h field, what's the b field? What do we do with it? Multiply by. by <coughs> Mu naught. And now I mean, let, it's mu technically, but mu naught because it's okay. there. Yeah. And now I have the B field. All right. So I can go here and I can put my B field here would be mu zero I. And why don't I call this I1 and this I2 so I could have technically a different current. And then it's divided by 2 pi, I call it d, right? And it's in the minus ax direction. So take a look at this. This is the differential force, right? It's equal to i1, i2, times mu zero, mu zero here, right? It's over two pi d. And then what happens here? What is az crossed into a minus ax? Well, az crossed into ax would be what? Ay, right? Over the minus, it would be minus ay. Do you agree with me? Sure. So it would be minus a y. That's the differential force, and it's, I got a dz in here too, I didn't put that. So the differential force here, right, is given by that. And if I wanted the actual force, the different, or the force per meter, I'd integrate this over one meter, wouldn't I? Now you see it's just dz, so if I integrate dz, I get z from 0 to 1 is just 1. So there, I, therefore, I can say the force per meter on that second wire would be minus mu 0 i 1 i 2 over 2 pi d, and it would be a y. Now, here's something real important to see. And in physics, they should have taught you this. I have two wires and I have current in the same direction, right? Now the force from this one is pulling this wire towards this wire. You all see that? What about the force in this wire? Here you can do this. You can do this with just a mental exercise. Remember the differential force is IBL cross B, right? So. Which way is the B field here on this wire from this wire? What direction? The way you do it is what? Take your right hand, put your, right, your thumb in the direction of the current, and, and your fingers curl around the direction of the H field, which over here is coming out of the board, is it? You agree with that? So it's coming out of the board. That's the B field from this wire here. My current's going up, so when I have IDL cross B, the actual differential force here will be the same as the force here on this wire, and the two wires are pulling together. You all see that? And the force is this. Now this force is not much. I mean, you got. I mean, remember it's a new. Right? That would be the force per meter. Mu zero is four pi. Let's just talk about this for a second. When I take a look at the force right there, it's equal to mu zero, which is four pi times 10 to the minus seven henrys per meter over two pi. That's divided by D, whatever that is. And it's times I one, I two. This is in newtons per meter force, right? And the force is attractive. 
So the two wires are pulling together. All right, you can see the two pod cancels. So I have two times 10 to the minus seven. I1 times I2. Let's do a mental experiment. A large current would be 100, right? All right, so make it a, make I1 equal to I2 equal 100 amps. That's a fair amount. So if I, 100 is 10 squared. If I multiply them, I get 10 to the fourth divided by D. Make D one meter. That's two times 10 to the minus third newtons per meter. If we divided that by 4.5, call it five, we get really, uh, and we get it in pounds roughly. So if we take two over five, that's four over 10. <coughs> uh, that's four times 10 to the minus fourth pounds per meter. That's almost nothing. Do y'all follow me on that? That's very low. That's with 100 amps of current. Now, I did this to give you an appreciation for what I'm about to tell you. I've never seen this, but I had a professor, my major professor was doing his PhD, his name was Les Hale, and he worked out at Los Alamos. Los Alamos was one of the original nuclear test sites way back uh, in the World War II era. And uh, out there, and this is in a dry, arid desert land, but before, I mean, long ago, around 1850 or so, they were running railroad tracks, they had mining things, they had tracks all over. Because the railroads were the thing that really allowed the two coasts to communicate fairly easily and with uh, cargo and stuff. So anyway, there's a lot of buried railroad tracks. And supposedly, this happened. Now, when a nuclear weapon goes off, an air burst, you get a very large positive charge left. It's called comp, and you get all these electrons blown out. It's called Compton electron flux. But then, when they're blown out, all these charges, the electrons, want to get back to the parent charge, the positive charge. So they come through the path of least resistance. Railroad tracks are very low resistance. So, boom, goes off. Supposedly, and then this current. It's coming back. Now these are buried tracks because, you know, basically there's all sorts of dust storms and stuff. Stuff gets buried. But there's, if this is the parent charge and the railroad tracks have some radial component, I mean a different radial component at one end than the other, then they're the low resistance path. Well, actually when they did some of this excavation, apparently after the first nuclear weapon, I don't know this for a fact, the railroad dies, were, or the railroad tracks are pulled together off the dies. The amount of force that takes is astronomical. You know what railroads are, right? To take two rails and shove them together is a ridiculous amount of force. These currents are estimated as millions, maybe hundreds of millions of amps of current. Oh, so you're saying that the two tracks pull themselves into, into one track. Even oh. buried? Huh? Even buried? Under yes. Yeah. But you gotta understand the kind of. Oh, yeah. I've awesome. got I've got a couple of stories about this that I've observed myself. That this this so this happens, apparently happened. I don't know. I, I mean, there's no, you can look on the web. Maybe somebody's got photos. So then, uh, after they developed first it was the A bomb, the atomic weapon, a fission bomb. Then they developed fusion bombs, and those the hydrogen bombs, and then they had a test called a Bikini Island test. Have you ever heard of this? Thing? All right, Bikini Keep Island is a very famous test. Keep the hmm? Fat Boy? Oh. No, fat, those are World War I or World War II nuclear weapons with Fat Boy and Little Man. All right, uh, this was after, these are hydrogen bombs. I mean, the one that hit Hiroshima is about 100 kiloton, all right? These are 20 megaton. They're three orders of magnitude larger in their, in their blast kit. I mean, they level everything. I mean, if it hit New York City, there'd be no New York City, that kind of deal. So, they blew these off in the Pacific, it was an air burst, and they had a whole bunch of ships out there at a great distance, 
I don't know how many miles, but let's call it 100 miles maybe, something like that. And it was 2,000 miles away from, the power, from Hawaii. So after they lit the first one off, they couldn't communicate with any ships from like the California coast or Hawaii. What goes through your mind is they destroyed all the ships. No, what they did was create an enormous ionospheric event where it ionized everything up there and they couldn't get through it. It's basically, it, it caused all the propagating signals to get shorted out in that. And the second thing that happened is the power grid in Hawaii got taken down. And I was told this by my major professor. Now the power grid in Hawaii didn't have any solid state stuff on there. It wasn't a fast, but it has a lot of wires. The wires, as I just told you, a great pass for currents. What happened is the currents caused by the parent charge positive and these Compton electrons trying to get back went through the power grid in Hawaii and basically took them offline like a ridiculously large lightning storm would. Now you've seen when lightning hits sometimes the lights flicker. That's caused by current surges that are shorted to ground. But when the currents get to a certain point, the circuitry is taken offline because now it's going to a failure mode where it's going to just, somebody's going to have a house fire or something burn it up. So the power grid got taken offline. And this is unexpected because it was not the fast transient that we're talking about nowadays at EMP. And then people start taking a very careful look at the effects, the electromagnetic effects from EMP. And a guy named Connie Longmire did all sorts of work with the initial high energy pulse, as in, in my PhD was on the late time charge effects related to lightning, the electric field reconfiguration from charge related to lightning, but it was really about nuclear weapons. And believe me, uh, the, the, <laughs> There are, there are unbelievably horrific events that can happen besides the obvious, the, the burst and the burning and the radiation poison. I mean, it wasn't that, that's where the whole idea of EMPs came from originally, it was from nuclear weapons? Because it, it was. The electromagnetic pulse was first vis visibly seen with the first weapons test, and that was out of Los Alamos. But uh, you, you gotta understand something. Those bombs are firecrackers compared to what they got yeah. today. When you're talking about a 100 megaton bomb, that's equal to 100 megatons of TNT. Give me an idea of this in scale. You've heard the, uh, the mother of all bombs from Moab that Trump, dropped, Trump uh, dropped on. Actually, the US Air Force did this, but I mean, it was in, I've worked around some of these weapons programs. I know something about this. This was 15,000 pounds equivalent of TNT. If you've never been around dynamite, this doesn't mean a lot to you. But they drop and destroy. You know, a 2,000 pound bomb will destroy a city block. And I've been around a 2,000 pound bomb when it went off. I was six miles away. The overpressure was on there. But a 15,000 pound bomb coming down is getting close to a tactical nuclear weapon. There are about 20,000. Uh, actually, let's see. Yeah, there, there are 20 kilo, let's see, so. no, I, I, it's a lot less actually, but it's, it's enough so that we're not talking about city block, you're talking about like within about the equivalent of about seven or eight city blocks would be level with this. And then you talk about just one kiloton bomb, that's the one like hit like Hiroshima. The whole city, if you ever look at photographs, is like a 20 megaton bomb going off. Take a look at good look at New York City from the air. Nothing. Everything will be gone. Basically, everything above ground gets sheared away. And the thing about this is, is those kind of bombs, you think that's the bad effect. There's second order effects that may be far worse because they'll cause complete disruptions of the power grid and everything else. And it could be for I don't know, a year or more. And that would cause starvation. Believe me. Anyway, I've, I've read something about this. I don't know how much I know is right about that stuff, but it's horrific. And remember what I'm telling you about the secondary effects from nuclear weapons, both the high currents caused by the Compton electrons 
and the fast pulse that will take out the electronics that we put. I have stories about that. I did want to tell you one other thing about these current forces from current before. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use another problem, but. So, uh, in 1987, I was working at Dog, was, here as a professor, I was an untenured professor, and I was up at, I was, got a research appointment for the summer up in Dog in Virginia. And we visited a physics, this is a weapons lab, but it's physics lab up in New Jersey, or was it Jersey? Might have been uh, Maryland. Anyway, high energy physics lab. And they had a thing where they had a very, they had a large bank of capacitors they charge up and they discharge them in series to get millions and millions of volts. And they put them across these plates and they accelerate electrons. And these accelerated electrons will strike another plate and generate x-rays. Now the x-rays are something that they, there's a lot of reasons. However, when you got a large bank of very of capacitors charged up with huge voltages, bad things can happen. And one of the things that I know, because I was doing lightning work, I had to be at least moderately familiar with it is, if you have a large voltage, say you've got 20,000 volts between here and here, well I know it takes about 3 million volts per meter before things arc in the air. However, if you have thin filaments of conductors, copper strands, then at the tip there's a field enhancement. It has to do with it's proportional or inversely proportional to the radius of curvature of the tip of that. So as that rate as this thing gets pointier and pointier, you get a larger and larger electric field. We can figure this out through a solution of uh, the bell squared V laws. And I can show you this. It's an amazing fact. Well, Whenever you're connecting things, uh, you're connecting with copper wire. And every once in a while, there's a little bit of copper wire that's you know just coming off like a whisker. You know, so you're supposed to take these things and seal them with uh, some sort of an insulating material, like a goo that would, has a tremendous breakdown strength. But this time they weren't so lucky. So they got this large bank of capacitors. They're going to discharge charging charge up. And in there they have staircases, everything's steel in there, and they have railings about that thick, solid steel railings that run, so as you're walking you don't fall. And this guy, I think he's a physicist, he showed us this, he goes, I think it was about a week before we got there, they were charging up for a test, thank God nobody was there, and there was an arc that got off of one of the plates of the capacitor and its discharge path was through that rail to the other. And there's a, in plasma physics, there's an instability called a Bennett pinch or sausage instability. And it chopped up this solid steel thick bar into equally long pieces with straight cuts like this. And I mean about two inch long pieces and it made the whole bar chopped up like that. And it was an earth shattering boom and the, the guy said, this puts fear of God in these shows. We were in there in the control room when this happened. It was unbelievable. It scared us like nothing, like a bomb went off. And that's when I, I mean, I really started appreciating the power of these current discharges. Now, that's a very large discharge. It was probably close to a million amps, right? which is an enormous amount. But still, that's, that's a pinch, which means the thing not only had to go liquid, it had to go to plasma. And that, those kind of things make me thankful I wasn't there. <laughs> so those are some stories about magnetic forces and the shearing force there is caused by the QV cross B. But this is something else. You can look it up, sausage instability, plasma physics. And it, it is an amazing. So now um, I went through B field forces or wire. I can tell you that I'll give you problems that I want you to do with that and with velocity. Then if you look in the book, uh, they also have something with magnetic circuits and the forces on magnets. So let me, let me take you through this kind of, I'm going to do this in a way that's going to be the least painful. Now you all know circuit theory, right? Basic circuit theory, V equals IR. 
So I'm going to make equivalents. If we have a magnetic circuit, let me just show you. Here's a magnetic circuit. If I have a bar of iron, like so, and I'm what I'm trying to do is show you a solid core here. And I'm not doing that good a job, but you guys get the idea. Let me take that part out of it. And here, we have a cross section A. Is it, is it a solid core or a hollow core? It's solid. Okay. I, what, what I'm trying to do is show you, um, I'm trying to show you a square. See, this is hollow. And oh. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to show you something like this that has depth. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to wrap some wire around here. And I'm going to put a current I in there. And I'll have N terms. And I'm going to say that this thing right here This is a cross-sectional area. This thing has some length, some length around here. I'll call it LM, the magnetic link. Alright. And now I'm going to make analogies. Right. You're going to just have to work with it. That if you have a piece of material, remember before, if you had a piece of material of a given length L and it had a cross-sectional area A, so we'll call it A, and you want to know the resistance between the ends, R is equal to L over sigma A, right? Do you remember that? That was just basic standard resistance if you had anything. And sigma is the actual conductivity. Well, there's an analogy for magnetic resistance or reluctance. So if you have a magnetic material, a bar of magnetic material, And this magnetic material has a cross section A and a length of an L, and it has mu, which is mu relative times mu naught. Then something called the magnetic reluctance, and the symbol for that is R, is equal to L over mu A. Now this is called reluctance. Right, that's electric. This is resistance. That's reluctance. You'll see. I'm trying to draw the parallels. Have you seen this before, by the way? No. no. I want to say yeah, but it's been a while. Now, you also saw something where you had a voltage. This is electric. You had a voltage V. And if I put a resistor here, R, a current would flow, I, is equal to V over R, right? We call that Ohm's law. Here, the current really has to do with a flow of electrons. In magnetic circuits, we have equivalent for V, and that equivalent is Ni where N would be the number of terms right here, and I would be the current T through each term. And then if I put that magnetic resistor, I'm going to just call it a script R, the reluctance. Then you would get a magnetic flux that would flow that would be NI 
over the reluctance. You all follow me on this? I'm trying to show you the parallels. So instead of voltage, now we have Ni. And voltage is really electric pressure. This is like magnetic voltage, right? It's Ni. It's called MMF, magnetomotive force. Do you have a question, Nathan? Um, no, so I was just trying to follow. You with me? All right, now, I'm trying to do this in a way that would be most useful. Here, all right, I've got this. I can say, well, if this has a cross-sectional area A, if this resistance was that, then I would actually get J would be equal to I over A. Are you with me on that? If we assume that a current was flowing in this bar, then J would be the current density, wouldn't it? Remember that? Well, we'd also have an equivalent to this with magnetics. We'd also have a magnetic flux, and that would be called B, and B would be equal to the mag I'm sorry, the magnetic flux density, magnetic flux over the cross-sectional area. Now you all remember that, um, I, I mean, I'm trying to draw an analogy. Remember, the current density, we always get by taking the current that the, over, divided by the cross-sectional area it's flowing through, right? Here, when we're assuming this thing's got an area A and this has an area A, we can get the B field, which is the flux in Weber's, divided by the cross-sectional area it's flowing through. And it's assuming it's, everything here is assuming it's uniformly distributed. So we're not, we're not taking into account anything weird like fringe. Now, what else is J equal to? I had it up there a second ago. What is J equal to in terms of E? Anybody? You're right, it's sigma E, right? Do y'all remember that? J is sigma E, correct? So if we have J and we divide by sigma, we have the E field, correct? Well, down here, what is B equal to? Mu H, right? So therefore, if we have B and we divide by mu, now we have the H field. Are you with me on this class? All right, I'm trying, I'm going to put down the relationships of the magnetic circuit, the parallels, in one second. As a matter of fact, do you have your book here, anybody? I know what this lecture is going to be about. If you open, let me see. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out the reluctance. Is that the same as resistance? No. Take a look, it's L over sigma A. The L over A is the same. Here it's sigma for resistance, it's mu for reluctance, right? Okay. What is, oh, okay, gotcha. This is just dimensions, L over A. Okay. And it's, sigma is an electrical parameter. Yeah. This is a magnetic parameter, mu. Got it, okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna. No, that's EMF. That's chapter five. This is chapter four. I did this the, on page two forty uh, is the magnetic forces uh, that I was showing you, and then he does the flux. We'll get to that in a bit. I'll get to that torque and what I wanted to do today, though. Is the magnetic circuit? Where does he have that? Oh. This is on page 272, but I don't know if he draws the analogy. Yeah, he's got it on the bottom of page 270. And you can look in your books. And I'm going to put up these parallels, and I'm going to do a magnetic surface problem, and then we'll talk about magnetic forces.
find yourself. So here's the deal. When you have magnetic circuits, you're going to need an electric or magnetic circuits. You know, you have a voltage if it's electric. In magnetic circuits, you're going to have an MMF, magnetomotive force, that's equal to anion. Those are parallel. Then, in electric, you have current I. And I is actually equal to V over R. Over here, you're going to have a magnetic flux. And that's equal to Ni divided by the reluctance. In electric circuits, you have an R. And for simple structures, R is proportional to length, inversely proportional to signal, sigma inversely proportional to cross-sectional area. In the magnetic circuits, you have a reluctance equal to proportional to L, inversely proportional to mu, inversely proportional to A. This is in your book if you look there. Then you also have J, which is I over A in electric stuff. Here you have B, which is equal to the flux divided by A, or Ni over the reluctance divided by A. And finally, here you have J is equal to sigma E, or E is equal to J over sigma, and in magnetic circuits, you have H, or let me do it this way, B is equal to mu H, and therefore H is equal to B over mu. And in his book, he does one more. He just says for electric, you have sigma, and magnetic, you have mu. But that's basically the parallel. So we're going to do, I'll set up a simple problem and show you. Everybody follow me on this class? So I'm going to show you the simple problem. It comes up over and over. So here's a typical basic magnetic problem that you might see. I'm going to draw what I drew originally. I'm going to say this thing has a cross-sectional area A. It has a permeability mu. And mu is going to be assumed much greater than mu zero. So when I say cross-sectional area A, I mean this. And it's going to have N windings. It's going to have a current I. It's going to have a length, a path length around it. L, M. And the question is, what is the H field inside? And this is called the core. Now, just something for you to know. This is really the basic beginnings of a transformer analysis. Like, you know what a transformer is? An iron core transformer. It's just a block of metal with a lot of turns on one side, a lot of turns on the other. What happens is this metal has a very large mu, it's usually iron, and it causes all the magnetic flux to flow in here. You with me? Magnetic flux is like current. Very little flows outside. So if we want to figure out what the H field is, we draw a magnetic equivalent circuit. We do it. 
by starting and saying we have a plus to the minus equivalent voltage, which would be Ni. Are you with me? This is just like an equivalent voltage, right? Then we have an equivalent reluctance. And the reluctance here, or magnetic resistance, is equal to the length. I just let it as Lm over mu, whatever it is, divided by cross-sectional area. I'm trying to just finish this up here. Then, and again, I'm restating what I did before. Are you with me on this? This is given by the dimensions in that problem, correct? Lm is going to be the path. Then I'm going to have a, an actual magnetic flux flow, and that's simply Ni divided by the reluctance, just like you would find a current. Now once I have that flux, now I can get the B field, which is that flux divided by the cross-section A, right? Cross-section A would be given. And finally, I would get the H field in the core by taking the B field and dividing it by mu. So this is the steps. I'm already two minutes, actually three minutes over. So I'm going to stop there and give you some homework. All right. Now we talked about uh, Monday having a quiz, right? Yes. So on Monday you'll get a quiz, and it will be related to the last two lectures on magnetic forces. And uh, who knows? Maybe I'll give you something on this as a bonus. So to make sure you do it. And. Uh, I mean, do you have questions about this?